Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so we'll be talking. Um, the, the next three speakers again are, are Alex, Mercedes, myself, John Paul, and Chadwick Moore will be speaking at the end. So make sure you stick around for that. Uh, Alex Mercedes is vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee. He's a three-time Libertarian Party candidate from New York, and he's currently a uh, he's a current and former officer in the Brooklyn and Manhattan Libertarian Party, and an avid podcaster vlogger, and media producer. He has 10 years experience as a financial industry trainer and is a former hobby and, um, and, and uh, ho- hobby and, oh, I misspelled it, comics store owner. Awesome. Uh, and uh, he's also a concert promoter and a college radio broadcaster. Alex? Hey, everybody. Can you get this on? Here. Okay, I'll just go right here. Hey, everybody, my name is Alex Merced, and I'm the vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee. Um, basically, I'm in this whole liberty game for three reasons hope, opportunity, and empowerment. Now, what I want to do today is first kind of tell you guys my story because I think my story can help tie into why I care so much about opportunity and why freedom and why people having liberty can help people create their opportunities. And then uh, talk more about things like regulation and taxation and how that destroys opportunity. Okay, so first off, um, my mom, she was an immigrant from Guatemala. My dad from Puerto Rico. They met up in Connecticut. And um, me happened. So basically, I grew up in Connecticut. Uh, Then we spent a year in Florida where my brother was born. Some people are just better separate than together. So eventually they separated. Both of them kind of went through their own journeys, per se. But I had to really watch, so I was basically raised by a single mom, me and my younger brother, and I had to watch my mom go through things I can never imagine going through, working three jobs to make put food on the table, at the same time while going to school to give her, to be able to offer us a better life down the road. Um, basically, I remember when I was like a little kid, just sitting there doing like flashcards, helping her with her classes. So I'm sitting there like a five-year-old sitting there doing medical terminology with my mom. Um, but watching her go through that struggle, watching how the support that my family helped provide during that time, one, gave me, one, a value for hard work, value for determination, and value for what an individual can do when they want to change their life. Also, the, the importance of family and social networks, so the people we, we bring together into our lives and the people we care about. And that was kind of one of the first things that really kind of starts giving me the spark uh, that will later turn into sort of my love of liberty. Um, also, when I was a kid, for some reason, I, I guess I grew up pretty quickly considering everything that was going on, so I really enjoyed watching 2020 on Fridays. So I can't imagine many eight-year-olds really enjoyed 2020, but there was John Stossel. Yes, yes. And then John Stossel was doing his uh, consumer pieces. I'm like, yeah, that's not what I thought people were saying, but uh, you know what? He's got good points. That started kind of getting the wheels turning. Then in high school, so basically a little bit about the high school I went to. In Connecticut, they have what's called the Regional Vocational Technical School System. So what happens at the high school in my town, um, you know, like a, lot of, like a lot of high schools in a lot of towns, not necessarily was the greatest high school. So I opted instead to apply to the Regional Vocational Technical School in my area. I had that choice. And I was able to go to that school where I basically I was able to learn all my academics, math, science, etc. But I also was able to learn a trade. I was able to learn microcomputer, learn about programming, networking, etc. at high school, during my high school time. And that gave me appreciation for one, having the option. Um, and being one, the value of trades, the value of, again, creating many skills, a portfolio of skills. So I did that in high school. But in high school, one of my teachers uh, had us read a book, Anthem, by Ayn Rand. And at the end of the book, I, I still haven't read Atlas Shrugged and Full. I did buy it for my wife, and she kind of gave me, paraphrased it for me. But um, I did read Anthem, and at the end of the book, it gave me such an appreciation for individualism, the idea of ego, the idea of, you know what, I want to think for myself, that that also was another spark. But at this point, it still hasn't all kind of come together yet. So I, now I, then I later go to college in Ohio, Bowling Green State University where I get involved. At this point, politics isn't really my big thing, really music is, okay? Um, I have long hair, I'm playing guitar, I'm a college radio DJ, you know, I'm gonna be a rock star, it's gonna happen, okay? Um, I did get to open for Marcy's Playground once, that was kind of cool. Um, so then what happens is that while I'm in college, uh, there was a semester where I was a resident advisor, and I didn't have a car while I was in college, so I couldn't go see my favorite bands across the state. 
So for the first time, I created an opportunity. I said, you know what, instead of, to get over that, I'm gonna start a business. And I started a business of promoting concerts with all my favorite bands. So I was like, you know what, I'll just bring them to me. And they were able to make a few bucks doing it. Okay, so that was my first time where I said, hey, you know what, let me create my own opportunities. Okay, now that leads to me having a conflict being a resident advisor at the college. They weren't a big fan of me promoting events at the local bar while being a resident advisor, so eventually we part ways. So I have to move off campus at this point. And me and my roommate at the time, going through his own personal issue at the time, we both decided, you know what, let's show the world that we, we can bounce back. So instead of spending the money I had to go get a place to live, I used it to start a store, a comic book store. Okay, so here I am, we start this business, and the first day we have a line around the corner, we make back our investment in the first three months. Once again, creating opportunity, because why not? Okay, because after watching my, everything my mom went through, I was like, you know what? That can't be near as bad as what she went through. So these kind of things help shape that mind. At this point, I'm still quite to the left. Okay, I'm walking around with my Michael Moore DVDs, copy of the corporation documentary, okay, quite to the left. I voted, voted for Kerry in 2004, unfortunately. Okay, but then what happens is that after everything is said and done, the store does close. We were kids, it was one of our first businesses, and while we did really well as far as marketing it, we didn't realize that you should probably save money for a rainy day. Okay, so the store eventually closes, and to kind of keep myself motivated, I buy myself a ticket to the Philippines, because I still have one more semester of college to go. So I go through the semester of college, and as a reward at the end, I have a trip to the Philippines. But when I was there, the only channel that was in English was Fox News. So during that month, while I'm in the Philippines, so basically, you know, if I didn't go to the Philippines, I wouldn't be a libertarian. <laughs> so what happens is the Fox News debate, this is 2000, May 2007, and there's a debate with all the Republican candidates, and there's this guy on the stage by the name of Ron Paul. This is like that whole Giuliani, Ron Paul moment. And I see that, I'm like, I agree with everything this guy just said just now. That's not how this is supposed to work. I'm a Democrat. Okay, um, and I didn't think much more about it at the time. But then I come, back to, I come back to Ohio, I start doing some more research, and then I become obsessed. But I become even more obsessed with like economics and finance, which leads me to move to New York, which leads me to become a stockbroker, which leads me to become now a trainer of people in the financial industry for the last 10 years. Quite a turn in the direction, hair got cut the whole deal. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how I became a libertarian, okay? And then I didn't get involved with the Libertarian Party until 2013 when, because basically what I did during those years was promote liberty. Basically, as I was learning all these ideas of philosophy, economics, I documented it. Literally over 2,000 videos on YouTube of me documenting my entire intellectual journey. Because as I learned, I made a video about it so that I can get feedback, grow, etc. So I developed a little bit of a following and in 2013, they needed a candidate for New York City Public Advocate. So they'd be shocked and say, hey, Alex, can, can we put you on the ballot? And I'm like, why not? So I ran for public advocate, and I got involved with the Libertarian Party and haven't looked back since. So then after that, I ran in 2016 for U.S. Senate against Chuck Schumer. And you might have heard of him. Um, and, <laughs> and then last year, I ran for New York City uh, Comptroller, where I basically spent the year talking about the big issue of pensions, making sure that people can understand things like why discount rates are important, and the funding levels, and all the different real, real issues, especially here in New York City, that is pensions. Um, and then this year, I ran to be the vice chair of the Libertarian Party. And I, actually, that was probably the most intense of the four campaigns that I ran, where I traveled across the country, meeting libertarians across the country, talking about a, a message of positivity, a message of opportunity. Okay, instead of talking about, hey, you gotta understand all the numbers, you gotta understand everything right away, talk about hope, talk about, in, because what other people who are telling you that we should give up our rights to government, they're selling fear. They're saying, hey, you know what? The world is a scary place, and we'll make it less scary for you. You just need to give up your rights. You just need to give us the power. That's, it's easy to scare people. But to get people to take their rights back, to take control of their life, you need to give them home. Because I'm not gonna take the keys back unless I feel like I can actually make use of those keys. And that's a, that's, that needs a message of positivity, a message of empowerment, a message of warmth. That you want to tell people, you know what, you can take care of your life. I believe in you. We can do this. So people can take their rights. But it's not just telling them that. It's also create, being the example. Empowerment requires two things. The tools, that's what free markets are. The ability to start a business. The ability to enter a contract. The ability to do those things. But you also need a good example. 
Okay? For example, if I give somebody a hammer, a hammer can do amazing things. But if they've never seen someone use a hammer before, how are they supposed to know how to use it? Okay? And that's why we need people going out there being amazing entrepreneurs. Being the best person they can be. Because when, by being the best person you can be, then other people ask you, Wow, man, how do they do it? And they start co- trying to copy you. But they don't just copy the things that you're doing, they copy the ideas that you have. So if you're the best person that you can be, if I'm the best person that I can be, people will not only ask, what did I do to do the things that I did? But they'll also ask what I believe. And they start looking at the ideas that I believe and start embracing those ideas. So we can sell. That's why I always refer to a talk that I used to do called the Aspirational Libertarian. That you can sell the ideas of liberty by being aspirational. By being someone that people want to be. And by asking yourself, who do you want to be and becoming that person? Why not? It's your life. Let's do it. Okay? So that's one of the things. But the thing is that when we take a look at government, government can destroy opportunity very easily. Okay? Uh, regulation is a very good example of this. Okay? When I talk about regulation, I always like to bring up the subject of UNO. Why? Because I think this is a good analogy to see how regulations distort a market. Now, everyone here ever played the game UNO? UNO's fun, right? Now, are the rules complicated? They're very simple. Okay, if I put a red 4 on a green 2, one of the other players will tell me, you can't do that, Alex. Because the rules are simple, they are clear, and they are few, you can, everybody wants to play UNO. Okay? And you don't need a referee to play UNO. You don't need to have some arbiter or some enforcer. We all can hold each other accountable. Because the rules are few, and they are simple. But whoever played Dungeons and Dragons, Okay, I mean, I enjoy Dungeons and Dragons, but the problem is the rules are so many, so complicated, um, very few people ever want to play. It's really hard to find a people to play a game of Dungeons and Dragons on Saturday night. And then every step of the way, everyone has to argue the rules. Okay, let's go, and you have to go look through several books to figure out what the rule actually is. That's the regulations. It, one, it discourages people from playing. So you make business, the rules on business too complicated, people don't want to play. And then what happens? People don't even know if the rules are being followed. So it makes it easier for people to cheat. Okay, that's why you want less regulations. You want people doing business. And, you, and we can hold each other much more accountable when there's less rules. Okay? But people can move forward. When we think about mobility, mobility really comes kind of three different ways. Either through one enterprise, as I've been kind of mentioned a few times, but you could also invest money, okay, to grow your wealth. And three, you can also uh, learn new skills. But we've created barriers, or government has created barriers, in all three of these paths to have us grow. Okay, so when we think of entrepreneurship, we can think of all the regulations on businesses and taxes. Okay, and not only do they discourage people from starting a business, but they make it more expensive to start a business. That might not matter to someone who's a millionaire or a billionaire, but if you're that person who wants to lift themselves up out of poverty by starting a business, um, that extra hundred dollars you may have to spend to file a paper, piece of paper, or the extra here and there, may make all the difference between whether you start that business or not. Okay, when I started the business in Ohio, it was ten thousand dollars between me and my buddy, and we were able to get a business started, get a rent, a location. In New York City, ten thousand dollars would probably be just like filing one paper, or paying for like an hour of a lawyer's time. Okay, you just wouldn't go as far to start a business, making it much harder to start a business here, and you have a lot, you'll have a lot less of that. Now, when we think about skills, okay, if you want to go into another skilled industry, you can't just learn the skill. You have, you have licenses everywhere you go. I think one out of three jobs nowadays is su- subject to a license, which requires, and that's what I do. I train people to p- take licenses. I see people who are struggling, looking to get into a new industry to improve their lives, and they have to spend like six months training. They can't afford that time if they have a family and kids in that they want to provide for. Okay, so now that opportunity has gone from them. Okay, and then we take a look at investment. Nowadays, what's the rule? More risk, more reward. We've tried to take all the risk out of investing, but if there's no risk, there's no reward. Your average investor doesn't have any opportunities left. All the opportunities to invest in are now in the private market because we'll let other people take risk. But that means you're giving them all the reward and not letting the rest of us have it. Okay, so basically every way where you can have mobility has been locked away by government in some way, shape, or form. That's why we need freedom, we need liberty, we need to allow people to make mistakes, we need to allow people to seek reward, we need people to have opportunities by not getting in their way. And that's why I'm a libertarian, that's why I'm in the liberty game, and that's why I am the vice of the libertarian national party, because I believe in it and I want to make it happen and I want to see it happen. By one, setting, by being an example to 
that people can, and telling others to be an example, that people can aspire to, to promote the ideas, but also calling out the bad things that are happening, that are holding people back. And uh, that's, that's what I got to say. My name is Alex Mousset, I'm the Vice Chair of the Libertarian National Committee. And uh, yeah, subscribe to the podcast, find me on Twitter, I'm not hard to find. Uh, do I have time for like a question or? Okay, let's take a question, who's got a question for me? Okay, well in that case, you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you guys, thank you Grand Opportunity, uh, Grand Opportunity USA for having me here today. It's been fun and you guys, you still got a couple more awesome speakers on the way.